Vincent. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for coming in and joining us this evening. And over to you, David. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for coming along to our webinar this evening. My name is David Ball, and I'm responsible for all of the part time and intensive revision courses uh, that uh, your son and daughter may have attended over the last few months. Um, I'd just like to welcome you all to the event. Thank you very much for your time and introduce Dr. John McGinty, McGinty um, to give him his full time, um, and who has over 30 years of experience of helping and supporting students transition from second level education yeah. into university life. I hope you find the uh, webinar valuable and thank you so much again. Thank you very much, David. So good evening, everybody. Um, it is a pleasure to join you this evening. Uh, give me a sec, I'll just get this stopped. One moment, let me just get this going. So I'm just going to share my slides now. So you're seeing these just to introduce myself and it's a pleasure and delighted that you could join us this evening here at the Institute of Education. As my colleague David Ball mentioned, uh, I've been a guidance counselor for a large number of years and working with students over the last 30 years in terms of that transition from second level, working with students at second level and then transitioning into third level. Uh, so it's a fantastic school here and I'll be drawing on a lot of my experiences, both from here in the school, working with our students, but also as a parent of three students who've progressed, thankfully, through the Leaving Cert and then on, on to college as well. Uh, one of the things just to mention to you is that please, please know that in terms of the logistics this evening, uh, there's the Q&A that you'll be able to just uh, put in any questions that you have. And I'll be delighted I'm not in any rush away or anything. We'll be able to take towards the end have a look into those questions and I'll be delighted to, to answer of them as, as best I can. Uh, I suppose one of the things just to say to you is that definitely in the case of a family, I'll see this this evening as the element around not only just the student in the household, and it may be that you've one or two or more students who are actually taking, going through the senior cycle, taking various exams, but that element around the interaction in the house and what happens is there's elements around the effect it would have not only on the student themselves, but the entire household. So I'll be kind of interchangeably talking about the, the student, uh, but interchangeably talking to you as a parent as well. So that sort of holistic approach of understanding that, you know, the, the, the kind of project that's underway in terms of the Leaving Cert, the Junior Cert and Senior Cycle and such. And even if you have people in college, there's a sense of the entire household involved in a whole journey um, and what I want to do is share with you the aspect of the, the strategies and the coping mechanisms that are there not only for your own uh, student and your own child, but also for you yourself. So it's a sense of understanding the journey that you're on as well. I kind of conclude, and, and one of the important things just to say is that my colleague, um, Charlotte Campbell, here in, in the team at the school, will be sending out all of the slides to you tomorrow. So, so don't worry about anything that you may have missed it, the session is being recorded and so you're going to get all of the information from us um, and I'm happy to take any questions at all um, uh, for the session and then you'll be able to, to see the slides then tomorrow when, when Charlotte sends them through. Uh, one of the things just to be conscious of is that, you know, in terms of you hear this word, it pervades a sense of stress, but, but one of the things just to be aware of uh, and one understands that in a household, there's a level of stress, a level of busyness that's there all of the time. And then the leaving certificate comes along. And what we find is that the leaving cert is something not just that the student is undertaking, but the entire household. So that sense of almost everybody is, is doing the leaving certificate. Uh, but, but just to reassure you, 
Uh, and it's one of the things that I can appreciate when you're 17 and 18 and 19, you feel this is a massive journey. It's a massive set of things that are happening. You know, one finds here in the school, students have moved from mocks into orals, into projects, and there's a sense of a continuous um, sense of pressure. Uh, but, but in a way, as we all know, that the Leave Insert is a journey that the students will come through and they will come out the other end. Um, so there's a certain known period of time. Uh, but obviously, when you're in the middle of it, you feel as though it's going to be for longer than, than, than you wish for. So it's just to be there with your student to support them in that. One of the things as well is the sense of building resilience, the sense whereby part of the leaving certificate and, and the sort of breadth and depth of the subjects is for students to kind of have that range and that sense of being able to cope. So there's a coping mechanism that's happening tr through the leaving certificate. And indeed, and my, my own background is both at second level and third level, you know, when students come through the leave insert, it's almost a two year cycle. And then the exams are a whole uh, spectrum across the entire month. Whereas in college, what happens is there's teaching for about 12 weeks. And then what happens is students are assessed on that and then they move on. So if I can say one reassuring thing as a parent, especially if, you, if it's the eldest or, or your only child, that sense whereby the continuum of college as such isn't at the same intensity as, as like what you're finding at the moment, uh, either at the um, at, at the leaving certificate. Obviously, we can sense a sense of presenting issues and there's a sense of changing in behaviour and that sense of irritability with, with sort of shorter fuses across the, the entire household. So, so one of the things you find is that, you know, in a period of stress or anxiety, people's capacity to listen, people's capacity to, to, to engage you tend to have a shorter fuse. What can happen is a student and indeed the family in the sense of can feel that there's a sense of, of, of trepidation, a sense of anxiety that, that kind of comes through the household. So there's a real sense of a, a holistic, a sense of the entire house being part of this. But obviously for the student, there's the aspect of, you know, the sense of you know sweaty palms and knots in the stomach and sense of the eating aspect and the aspect whereby sometimes students will undereat and sometimes they'll overeat. There could be mornings where they normally would typically be having breakfast and then suddenly there's a sense whereby they're saying they just don't feel like it. The sense of a dry mouth, the sense of often through at different periods, something might have been said and it passes unnoticed or people don't mind. But what we find is at this particular time of year, there's a sense whereby something can just be picked up wrong. And so maybe other older siblings or younger siblings, or indeed the parents of students, things that typically wouldn't have mattered suddenly become a stress point. So it's just to be aware that that can happen. It, it, it's very common uh, and, and often a case of just being aware that this is happening it is half of the battle. And then obviously a sense, and we'll go on to that shortly, how would I actually cope with it and how, what, what would I do? Uh, one of the things that I think is so, so important, and I think as a parent and a guardian, you just need to signal the sense of a support that you are there for them, that in a sense, there'll be ups and downs. There's a roller coaster that will happen. There'll be some days of elation, some days of feeling this is really going well. I'm really doing kind of I'm enjoying my subjects. It's, it's really happening for me. And then there could be other days where there's a sort of a speed bump. There's a sense of I'm not really understanding and we're doing maybe differentiation or something in maths and it's really not sticking or there could be something in biology or chemistry. And there's a sense suddenly whereby things are not going as well. And the core piece, I think, for a parent is the sense to be there as, as a sense of support. That That's the kind of number one objective, it, that sense of of being there in the moment for your son or daughter to 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 be as, to, to be with them. I think you can see it here in the slide, the sense of results, because we all see it and, and we all know it, that yes, in some way, college admission and yes, in some way, progression, results do matter. But we as human beings are much more than a number. We as human beings have a whole sense of a diverse range of attributes and competencies and abilities. And often students might take a more scenic route through life and may decide to do different things and, and do every bit as well. So I think it's that signaling and saying to your son or daughter that while the sense of results 
we understand will be a progression. It's a sense of progressing on to the next level. But we also understand that often in life, people may not have had brilliant results and yet do really, really well. In fact, I tend to say to students, if we were using almost a sporting analogy, it's the sense that they shouldn't be aiming for Olympic medals. They shouldn't be aiming for world-class medals at all. It's that sense of just striving to be the best. There's almost a personal best. They're just trying to be their best. And in some way, they can only be that measure for themselves to try their best. And I think there's a sense whereby what we talk about this emotional resilience, there's, there's a part in life whereby, you know, we understand it as parents, but it's very hard to understand it when you're 17 and 18 and going through the cauldron of, of the leaving certificate. But there's a capacity building that's happening, a sense of being able to take the rough and the smooth and being able to say, yes, I've tried something, I've given it my best shot and understanding that it, it's never going to be perfect. I think that that's, that's so important. I think when we're working here with students um, here in the Institute of Education, what we try to endear is that sense of learning, say, from the mock results, the sense of undertaking an exam as if it was the real thing in June. But one of the things that I see every day, and I, I was with a student today, and he, he was very honest, he just held up his hand and said, do you know what, I missed a whole section in English paper one. I, I just missed a whole, and in, in a lovely way, he was saying to me, but you know what, I've learned as much from that as if it had gone well. So, so that sense of mock results, mock results are simply an opportunity for the students to have had a chance of understanding, I'm sitting down, there's this blank sheet of paper. There's often a sense where in school, there are shorter tests, but the mock will allow them to take a full exam. And I think that's so, so important. But importantly then, the structure and the timings that are embedded in those papers, students are able to kind of learn from it. So I think one of the things as a parent is to be conscious that the mocks are sort of a results would be coming true at this stage and to be seeing them totally as a learning opportunity. And often students will learn more from the learning and the doing than actually the mark that they get from the mocks. I just want to say a few words about the oral exams. And, and one of the things I think for, for you as a parent and, and a guardian, you might be looking out and thinking that June is going to be the sense of crescendo and June is going to be a whole series of days. June is going to be, um, but I think as a parent, and you'd see it here in the school as well, what you find is that the oral exams does bring a significant step change in students' anxiety. Now, it may be that students have been going along swimmingly, or it may be they have had a sense of, of, of stress and anxiety, and then the oral exams adds to that. But but can I just say, you know, as a as a former as a parent myself, as a parent who has got, has had a number of children going through this piece, that one of the things we would have learned was that the oral exam is a moment in time because I think it's the sense whereby it's it's contributing to the exam result. In the case of Irish, it's the 40%. In the case of others, it's 25% for the orals. And yes, it's marked as a common paper, but there's a real sense often whereby if you as a parent realize suddenly that there's a higher sense of anxiety, please be aware that that's something that the orals do bring to a household and, and just to be conscious of it. One of the things I just want to talk about is, is the aspect of healthy habits. And I think this is importantly where you as a parent can come in because one of the wonderful things is, is you can show and demonstrate tangible aspects of, of support. And it's the sense of, yes, it's the balanced meals, the sense of breakfast, the sense that so that they don't get dehydrated and sense of headaches and stuff, copious amounts of water is so important. You know, we are conscious of things like fizzy drinks, aspects around aspects around uh, caffeine and stuff. So, I, so we'll just be conscious of those. But what we, we really would be saying is the sense around um, the diet is so, so important because that's going to sustain them. That's going to be able to give them the energy. So, 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 so important. And, and it is absolutely what you'll find in, in the students will be they'll have particular preferences or particular meals or particular treats that they enjoy. And I think as a parent, just be 
listening to that and, and being sure to, to be able to say, yes, th this, this is the piece. I think then the next piece that I just want to mention is around about exercise. So, so it's often the case that when we think about it, um, one of the things that can happen is a student who is basically trying their very best often will try to work harder and harder. So one of the things we talk about here is a sense of a regime around, you know, the aspect of study, but also being careful about exercise, because what we do know, and it depends on what the student feels is right for them, but that sense of just fresh air, the sense of even just getting out for a walk will really help the student clear their head, get into the next session. And so those sense of exercise is, is so, so important. And, and as you can appreciate, the other thing that's so, so important is the sense of sleep. Um, when we go to sleep, what happens is the learning that we would have had is sort of stored away in our memory. The brain is able to manage it and make, make it a sense whereby make the connections on something that you would have learned previously. And so there's a part around where the advice we'd give is that students wouldn't go straight from study straight to bed. There's a sense of a winding down routine. There's a sense where they're able to have a little bit of escapism, step away from the study, get a sense of sort of settling down and calming down. And, and that's so, so important so that they get the, the nighttime time routine happening for them. And then actually, you know, we know ourselves that, you know, phones, there's good and bad. The sense whereby there's a community aspect whereby they're able to connect in with their friends, listen to music and learning. Um, one of the things you find, especially around this orals, whereby students are able to tape aspects of the, the orals and, and play, replay it for themselves. So th these are so, so important. And yet we do know as well that the phone aspect can be something that can be detrimental to their concentration. So one of the things is the management of the phone while they're studying. And, and as a parent, just being with them and understanding, and they will know this themselves, but to be just so, so careful of it. Um, I just want to move on to, to an area of one to one communication time. And if, if you know, and you'll see it in my conclusion, if I was to say, you know, what are the core tips that we would give? I think there's a very, very important piece now over the next, you know, three months to, to have that space each day or evening or afternoon, whatever is working, whereby as a parent, and it may be different parents at different times, but what's called the attentive of listening, the sense of having the capacity to just listen to what your son or daughter is saying to you, you know, that sense of being able to be what's called present. And, and how we demonstrate that is the sense of eye contact, the capacity not to be distracted, because we ourselves are a victim of the phones and emails and so on. So just when you're about to hear how they're really feeling, you might be getting a call and, that, and that's distracting. So what we'd be saying is, you know, take that moment to actually allow the time for your son or daughter to communicate with you to say how it is they're feeling. And often it's the case that they might not want a solution. There's a sense whereby as parents, we naturally want to jump in and solve. We like to, to almost solve things. But often it's a case of just allowing them be maybe sounding off about something or something hasn't gone well. And all you're doing is listening. And often it's almost the silence that, that your silence will allow them get that sense of anxiety, that sense of whatever it is is causing them. So, so absolutely that silence that you can kind of bring to the communication is, is, is so important. Um, you know, if you wanted to even trial it for yourself, and, and this is, you know, if you took another adult in the room and just tried it whereby the other adult was, you were talking to them and they were looking the other way. So that sense of just how do you feel when that happens? So one of the things I'll be saying is, you know, try that for yourself with another adult, and then you kind of feel, yeah, to actually really listen to my son or daughter, you have to be very, very, very present. We can appreciate as well that often you will all understand or know other uh, cousins or other friends, kids, and they're on a different study plan or they're doing something else or adding. So what you're trying to think is, oh, does that mean my son or daughter has to do the same? So it's so important to allow 
them ownership of their study plan because it's that sense of self-agency that you're trying to encourage the sense of them taking ownership and saying here's my study plan so if you're policing their study so, so there's a sense of just being so careful around the element whereby allowing your son or daughter to decide their study regime helping them get to the point of what i describe as the goldilocks approach of not too much and not too little just the right amount so that they're able to kind of keep up and do their class time and study time so, so that's very important so just be careful as a parent that you're not doing the compare and contrast because that's going to cause difficulty and one of the things that we can't we can't be conscious of is that sense of catastrophizing that sense of always maybe coming from the negative so as a parent we really need to be positive we need to be supportive we need to give praise and we need to be very much in the corner of the student to help them be the best they can be and finally just seeing the slide the sense of having fun it's so important because that's going to the sense of humor the sense of just enjoying things enjoying treats you know the thing that maybe is their favorite meal, a favorite restaurant, something that they really enjoy because they do need an antidote to the, the, the stresses and strains that, that inevitably come along. And, and often like there's a, a moment where we celebrate milestones. It's so, so important as a parent to recognize the end of the orals, recognize the end of the various milestones. So be it graduation, be it the end of exams, the results, all of that just to be there, there for them. I just wanted to share, and, and you'll see this in the slides that we'll send out tomorrow, but one of the things that can happen is, is a sense, even for you as a parent, to be conscious of, it's such a busy existence. And, and often people might say, you've heard in mindfulness, or, or, but I don't have time. And ironically and paradoxically, often it's the case that if you do create a little bit of time, a little bit of space for your son or daughter, but also a space for yourself, um, there's a writer called Harry Barry, Dr. Harry Barry, who wrote a really wonderful book called Emotional Intelligence Resilience, Emotional Resilience. And, and what he describes is a piece around because of such our busy lives, that what we can do is create a three minute window. Now, it, you know, the first time you do this, it's going to be difficult, but he just asks people to, in some sense, ground it. So you're just sitting comfortably, making sure your feet are on the ground. And it's so short, you can do this maybe a couple of times a day, but appreciating that when you do it first, it's going to be unusual, it's going to feel funny. But what will happen is over time, the more you do it, the better you'll feel, the better you'll get. And it's the same as well for your son or daughter, because they'll be aware of mindfulness, but you're trying to get it something that will work for them. So what, what Harry Barry would be saying, Dr. Harry Barry would be saying in, in the first moment, minute, you're just closing your eyes, you're of an awareness of your thoughts and your, and your physical sensations. But what he would describe is, is you don't for a moment challenge them. You don't try to change them. It's almost like they're thoughts that are clouds in, in the sky. They're ju just moving on. And, and I was at something recently where we, I, I heard that we think about 70,000 different thoughts in a day. And about 60,000 of those were thoughts that we had yesterday. So that's the, the brain and it's so busy. So just conscious that there's a busyness and then in the second minute there's a part around in fairness oxygen to the brain and oxygen from breathing is so important so in that second minute of focus on breathing so it's just one hand on your chest and one hand on your tummy and uh, seven seconds in and nine seconds out and it's just that sense of a sense of just breathing because that kind of almost again brings you more present and then the third the minute three is an aspect whereby it's the awareness of your body and, and often people who would be, I suppose, spend a good bit of time on mindfulness, describe it as a body scan where they're, they become just conscious of maybe their toes and their feet. And then each minute or each moment they're moving up. But what Harry Barry would say, even if for shortness, you could actually just pick the four limbs and just sense an awareness and a sensation on, on your limbs. and and when you're doing this a couple of times a day across say a month what you'll find is it becomes really beneficial because it sends it grounds you and it absolutely will feel strange at first uh, but but it's something that over time uh, will will really give you real benefit and almost paradoxically what i was saying is the busier we become the more important it is to do this this piece of work for ourselves 
Um, I just want to move on to mention a few things around resources. And, and one of the things that we often find is that, you know, you're thinking, okay, uh, where would I go to get help and assistance? One of the wonderful websites is the HSE website is really good in terms of a student's, say, anxiety or mental health, the sense of it's a really fantastic set of resources. Obviously, in schools like here in the Institute of Education, we have a kind of a range of pastoral and guidance counselling support for our students, but that would be in existence in schools right up and down the country. And it's either through the pastoral side of the school or the, or the guidance counselling school who would give that support to a student at check in. So, you know, it's that sense of a, of a student who's coming to you, your son or daughter feeling that there's, you know, sense of stress and anxiety. Where should they go? I think in that sense is that listening ear and but the please know that there would be resources, uh, both digital resources online, but also resources in terms of the school to support. Um, I, I do mention the sense of autonomy, the sense whereby students have a sense whereby the self-agency, the sense of they know very much a significant amount for themselves. And, and it's only the sense whereby there's an escalation needed beyond the school to, to, to a local GB if that was needed. But, but I'll be sharing some resources later on and, and assisting in that. But I think importantly for you as a, as a parent, the analogy I'd give is the sense whereby your son or daughter is in the driving seat. They're visualizing, they're trying to do the best that they can. They're going on with their life to try to manage and cope with all of the various pieces. It's almost not disempowering, allowing them to, to press on. And there's an analogy that almost they're in the driving seat and you're helping to help them navigate. So you're a passenger and, and the various school teachers and the school community is helping them, but very importantly, it's allowing them control and, and moving forward with their own uh, with their own lives. Uh, one of the things I'd be saying to students, because I'm conscious, it's very, very important that we as parents, it's it's a joint project. It's a sense of a holistic, the school, the, 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 the home, you as a parent, the students working together. But often for students, they have to be so careful to be able to honest and sense of reflect on how things are going. I mean, I was talking to students today and, and there's that sense of being able to say, this is going well for me, this isn't going as well, and the capacity to be able to say, what's the right thing to do? Um, I had a student with me today who was interested in, you know, subjects that don't need honours maths and, and you get that sense where they're deciding, will I continue in honours maths or, or switch to the ordinary level? So so students will have to, you know, that sense of reflect that re being reflective and seeing what's the right piece for me. One of the things that we find as well with students is that they have a real understanding of their study timetable, the things that work for them and the capacity to adjust. So it might be that they need to do more on one subject and less on another and being able to manage that themselves. Uh, and obviously there's a slight risk sometimes where students say, oh, I must get 100 or I must get the sense of the pressure that they put on themselves. But in fact, in some way, we can, as parents, help them to understand that yes, it would be lovely for them to get whatever it is that they dream about, whatever it is that, that they really want. But I think as a parent, you've also got to be careful to say, but if that just didn't come for you, what would be the other possibilities? And, and that sense whereby, yes, it is really good to be ambitious, to try and be your best, but it's also really important to be able to have some fallback positions and strategies to, to help you as well. Uh, one of the things just to mention for students, and I'm conscious we have students who are maybe doing the Leaving Cert, cert but also and in sixth year, some in fifth year, and some in third year, and, and across the full spectrum. One of the things that we have to be so careful about is, is just striking the right balance, that they themselves are able to say, as I described earlier on, the Goldilocks approach, that not too much, not too little, because the risk is that the sense of too much would lead to burnout in the sense of whereby students you know, that sense sometimes a student might be tempted to stay up late, work through, but what will happen is the next day they'll be the less uh, capable, less competent, the sense of, and will kind of run out of steam. So the student who's studying right into the night, unless they're very different biorhythms, what happens is suddenly they will feel, I, I kind of lost track. I, so they, that sense of being able to know when to have a flexible study plan to get the best of them. And one of the things that you often find is that a student is able to say, I've got my plan in place. And I think this is a sense as a parent to be supportive of them, that they'll know, well, 
I'm going to maybe watch a film or I'm going to go to a match because they're able to to move and shift. And I think that's so important to to support them in, in that decision making. And typically what we find is that students learn in different ways. So it might be that you as a particular learner are more visual or kinesthetic with learning by doing, but your son or daughter might be more of an oral and may need to speak and or read. So it's just being able to be aware that different students have different study and learning styles. And it might be that it's not aligned with yourself, but being aware that they will kind of work as to what works best for themselves. And definitely the guidance department and here in the Institute of Education, we would have a, a kind of a study schools colleague. Um, so that sense whereby definitely the guidance counselor within the school will help a student in terms of mapping out their educational plans and putting together effective study techniques as, as well for them. I just want to mention that if we roll on the next 10 weeks and we suddenly come to June, there's one of the things I think as a parent just to be ready for is the sense of it is so, so important around the timetable, the exam timetable, and students can't be admitted to an exam after a half an hour. And obviously they can't leave an exam without in the last 10 minutes, but but that's peace around, you know, for students beyond the 30 minutes, they're not going to be admitted to an exam. And so it's so, so important that the timetable is very visible, that there's a contingency plan in the event that say somebody isn't able to get or get a bus or whatever. It's almost as a parent and the guardian to know whatever it takes because of the sense of the two years has gone into these particular day. The day has arrived and it's to be there. The aspect of having everything ready the night before is, is, is very important, the, the, you know, because they may need a count, you know, the, the actual math set tables and so on, just so have all of that. And often you don't want to arrive at an exam and find that the student is stressed before they get to the exam. There's a sense of just getting there in good time and, and being able to, to, to be ready for the exam and have everything ready in terms of water and sugar sweets and so on, just to have that. I think it's apparent there's a real sense sometimes whereby you might hear in the media, you might hear in the radio that a particular paper has gone really, really bad. And suddenly you find that that inevitably that has caused a lot of anxiety in the house because of that one paper. It might be, you know, paper one in maths on the, on a Friday afternoon. But but as we know, and, and in fairness, the State Exams Commission do try to their best to kind of have a fairness from year to year in the results. And so often it's a case of understanding that sometimes a very hard exam might be marked with some leeway. And, and so in a way, just to be there for the student and, and for your son or when they come home, that sense of, yes, they'll want to talk about it. Yes, they'll want to kind of go through the main points for you. But as a parent, it's very, very important to step back and not engage with, unless you're a subject teacher, but in a sense, there's a lot, not a lot that can be kind of gained from going through. And being able to kind of move to the next exam is so important. So, so that's the, the, the where, where to go. I just want to kind of almost say in terms of the after school pathways, because one of the things that I've been involved over many years now is, is working with students as to transitioning, thinking about what's the next step. And if we take, for instance, the, the CAO, one of the wonderful things now is that when we talk about school and points and so on, the CEO has 15, 1600 courses and lots of students can do different things. So one of the things I'll be saying is that Often a student might want to do, say, primary teaching or law or medicine or engineering. And there's a whole aspect whereby students can embark on that journey through maybe a level eight honors degree program in a university or in a technological university. But often students will be able to do a level six and then from that progress into a level seven. They'll be able to take courses in the QQI uh, to be able to kind of progress maybe the scenic group where they're able to build blocks as they go along. So, so and, and one of the new features this year is the National Tertiary Office, whereby students can work through the QQI and a PLC course and then move on to, to one of the, the colleges. So one of the things I just want to say is there are many, many different pathways. And, and as a parent, just be aware that when you're talking to your son or daughter about, you know, that it is only a particular course in a particular college, that is okay, but there's a risk that that becomes the be all and end all. So the wonderful thing about the CEO and indeed UCAS is a sense whereby 
there's a range of different options and, and just be aware of that. Um, change your mind, for instance, on the CEO will open on the 7th of May. And as a parent, just know that students can change their mind as often as they wish for zero cost, doesn't cost anything, right up until the 1st of July. So there's a window there of about five or six days after the leave insert whereby students can decide after the leave insert. Now, you can see my piece here around the pendulum effect, which we're so careful about because students might feel I've done particularly badly and they take courses off that they inevitably do better than they expected and they would have got that course. So just be careful of that pendulum effect. And one of the things just to be conscious of is the CEO statement of record will come true in May, email to every student. So if you have, you know, your son or daughter has actually applied, make sure that one of the things that you're helping them with is checking that statement of record in May, because it may be that they've applied for an exemption uh, from Irish or the exemption from another foreign language. They might have a leaving certificate number from a previous year. So all of that thing whereby you're helping them and the state, statement of record comes in from the CEO, sitting down and looking again at the courses and maybe then deciding. But, but just to reassure you as a parent that the CEO is a very flexible system and for no cost at all, they can change their mind as often as they wish right up until the 1st of, of July. Now, the only thing is there's a set of what are called restricted application courses, like maybe fine art or, or music where there was an addition people had to apply before the 1st of February. So other than the restricted courses, of which there's about 150, the other 1500 or so students can apply right up until 5 p.m. on the 1st of July. I talked earlier on around their choice and their decision and, and that sense. I think it really comes into sharp focus on the CEO, where it's so, so important that the final decision in terms of the rank order of preferences is the students. So that sense of you might visualize or sense that you'd prefer them to do college, go to college X or college Y, do course A or course B. But in the end analysis, it's so important that the student takes ownership of that and puts the choices into what it is that, that they wish. I just want to say one thing around the family holidays, because as we know, there's an accommodation search, especially if we're moving away from home. And, and one of the things that the in the recent number of years, the State Exams Commission have released the results in late August and results are kind of coming through in late August. So I think it's 2024, if, if you have somebody in leave insert, is a year for, I suppose, the entire family to be of that sense where you're around because there may be an accommodation to be to be found and so on, or decisions about offers. And so it's so important to be here and, and with them uh, at, at this time. Just want to mention around key messages then, the aspect around uh, what I said earlier on was the sense of a certain level of stress is inevitable and, and to be an awareness and an acceptance of it, the sense whereby, how would I describe, I, I suppose that sense of resilience that inevitably for all of us and in life, and I think the Leave Insert is part of that, it's the journey that we're on, that piece around the, the, the awareness of that there will be heightened levels of stress, but then the keep coping and have mechanism put in place. I think as a parent, the aspect of what I describe as these three P's, the sense of positivity, the sense of praise, the sense of the providing of the sort of logistical support around, you know, the food and the, and the, and the diet and, and the sense of care and attention. That's so, so important. I think I mentioned earlier on around this one to one communication time. I think if if that's in place, that's a really solid foundation. That moment whereby when they want to talk to you, that you have that availability, that you yourself are is not that you're not distracted. The sense of being capacity to listen attentively to, to hear. Often it's, as I was saying earlier on, sometimes just being silent rather than trying to jump in and solve and kind of rush to a solution. There's a sense whereby your son or might just want to sound off because they're angry about something. So it's just that listening ear um, and, and that sense whereby understanding that in life, the leave insert is really just one piece along a journey. Obviously, it's an important piece, but there's many, many different ways and different people will be able to progress into various areas that they wish to do in, in many, many different ways. Uh, we talked earlier on about the school resources, the guidance counselling, the pastoral, the teaching, the whole aspect of the school management that's there. 
uh, to, to help students. And then one of the wonderful websites that there is, is the HSE website, which has wonderful tips for, for younger and older folk around mental health and the capacity and the, and the resources that, that are there. I think it's important for me to kind of uh, also introduce you to a range of additional resources, which I just got these from the HSE website. So maybe always just maybe for up to date information, just check the HSE website. But what will happen often is that a student has a sense where you're feeling that they need some additional support and to be aware of that. And, and it's so important just to be aware of the additional resources that are there, some of it through the state and some of it supported by the state, but they're all there uh, to, to assist. So I just want to stop at this stage and say thank you. And I'm going to stop sharing the slides and then go back into the questions and then work from that for, for the rest of the evening, if that's OK. So please put in your your questions on the on the Q&A button. Thank you very much. I'm back here. So thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, I'm now just going to have a look just at the Q&A and pick up any questions that we might have had and maybe try and answer them as we go, if that's OK. If you joined us a bit late, what I what I'd say is that one of the things to say is that we have a set of slides that will be going out for you. So if there was any uh, things that you might have missed in my presentation, effectively, my colleague Charlotte Campbell will be sending out the slides tomorrow to all of the people who are registered. So absolutely, there's no issue there at all. And um, there is a Q&A piece on, uh, on, on your portal. So on the webinar portal, there's, there's the opportunity where you can actually put in a question. So if you have any questions for me at all, feel free to ask any questions. I'd, I'd be delighted to help in any way I can. Just wait a few minutes and, and allow anybody to ask any questions. Uh, so just to, to mention again, there's a Q&A button. Uh, so if you just put your Q&A into the, your question into the Q&A, I can actually pick it up. So thanks, Amin. The first question has come uh, from a, a, just the aspect of any advice for a student that just won't study. Um, one of the things is often it's a case of understanding the why. Why should I study at all? And so, so important to be able to understand the journey that the student is on. And often it's a case that a student has to understand the why. And what we'd find sometimes is a student will be able to be interested in a particular area and have decided this is the kind of area I wish to go to next. So one of the things we're trying to work through is to their own visualization as to what it is that they wish to do at the next step beyond school. Uh, because if, it, if it's a project or if it's something that they have an interest in, then they will see the benefit of it. Um, obviously, there's a part around working with them around, in some sense, there might be a subject that they particularly enjoy. And often, sometimes there's a resistance to even start studying because it's seen as a sort of just, just too big. So one of the things that we advise students is, maybe to start with the subjects that they enjoy, some subject that they like, and just get into the rhythm of having a space. I think that's so important at home, which is that study space and that sense of that there's a particular time where they kind of get no distraction and able to have that space and start studying something that they enjoy and then working from that. But I appreciate it's not easy for students there's the sense around a whole continuum whereby sometimes students are overstudying and finding that they've just run out of steam because they've done too much. And there's an entire spectrum of the sense whereby students are not studying at all. But I think one of the pieces of advice I'd give is that sense of just inevitably they're going to have to kind of get that self agency, but it's going to be the why as to why should I do that at, at all? So, but thank, thank you for that question. Um, there's a question around um, what are the thoughts on persisting with honours maths for the extra points if a student is finding it difficult? So, so that's a lovely question. Um, 
one of the things just to be aware of is is to say that definitely there's a set of courses that honors maths is required so for instance if somebody's thinking of maybe something in engineering or some degrees in computer science so the first thing i'd be saying is if it's the case that a student has their heart set on a course that requires a h4 in maths or a particular requirement in, in honors maths that they definitely should think seriously about dropping it however for many many students they're interested in areas that doesn't include honors maths at all and then there's an aspect whereby you only get to 25 points if you get a h6 which is 40 percent or higher if you get a h7 which is between 30 and 39.99 you don't get the bonus of 25 and sometimes when i'm talking to students they're thinking that they'll always get the bonus but not if you get a h7 you don't get the bonus and the other thing i'll be saying as well is that if a student genuinely, and I think this is an honest, reflective piece for the student, if a student can effectively across two or three subjects, bring the two or three subjects up a grade from say a H4 to a H3, that's going to be like 30 points. So, so, in it, so actually what can happen is a student who gives that time across the other subjects, as long as honours maths isn't a requirement for the subject that are the degree that they're really interested in, then they can actually catch up with themselves. And there is a benefit for that student who possibly would risk getting the H7. So, so that sense when you were saying about persisting with the honours maths, there's this aspect whereby if that time is spent on the other, um, I would definitely say, definitely as a parent, but as a student, that the student themselves talking to the maths teacher, because the maths teacher will have the sense as to their ability. But just please know, that the honours maths bonus points only kicks in if after the addition of the bonus it's one of their top six so a student with say a 25 points on a hitch six say which would be uh, 46 and 25 71 but if a student's all their other six subjects are a hitch three or above which is 77 they don't get the benefit of the honours maths so i think there's definitely an option there to to think seriously and I wouldn't be resistant for a student who feels, yes, it's the right, the right approach. There's a question around how, how should how much should a student be studying? So I think one of the things is that sense of as the year goes on, there's a piece around it's flipping between the homework and the study. Um, as a rule of thumb, we'd be saying that students would be studying in batches whereby it's 50 minutes of, of study, 10 minutes of a break. Um, Definitely, there's a sense of as the year progresses, it moves from the study time, at, uh, sorry, the, the schoolwork to study time. Would you be talking three maybe hours an evening ar across that leave insert or maybe more? And then obviously Saturday and Sunday, but building in time across Saturday and Sunday, which is, you know, time where they get a break as well. So that, that that's so important. Um, there's a question about the PLC courses. When is the best time to look at PLC? So that's the QQI, and, and I'd be saying there's a sense of simultaneous applications. So obviously there's a level eight list in the CEO, level seven, six, but reach out to the College of Further Education, perhaps the one that's closest to you and saying, OK, a visit to that college, understanding what's the courses there and an application to that college. Yes, you might be able to apply in August when you don't get maybe the CEO offer you want, but at that stage, a lot of other people could apply. So there's no harm and, and PLC colleges and further education colleges understand that they will assess an application, make a decision on it, and they'll appreciate that the student might not come to them because they're going to get a CEO. So the question you have, John, is the sense around when is the best time to look at the PLC? I honestly would not be averse to acting on it now, maybe over the, well, they will be closed over the Christmas, over the Easter break, but definitely have a look at the PLC the colleges near you, have a look at the courses and then put the application in. There's no sense of compulsion that you have to then go to that course, but it's really good to have it as, as a backup. Thanks Amir, for all these questions coming through. Um, is it a fact that the mocks are in general marked more harshly is, is a question. I, I think in fairness, the people who are marking the mocks are trying to give a realistic assessment for the student because they appreciate that the student needs to know I think what can happen is often a student is sitting down for the first time to a full three hour mock and and in a sense, the marks might be lower. But but I 
think there's a realistic piece as well. So I, I don't think it would be fair to say, OK, there's a very low mark in the MOX, therefore it's going to be much higher in, in the leave insert. I, that I'd be careful not, not to just assume that. Um, there's a question here just about a student that has recently been struggling hugely with health issues, uh, currently under investigation for autoimmune disease and it's causing a lot of, is it too late to get any supports put in place for exams if they get some sort of, okay. So definitely the advice here, there would be a learning support teacher in the school that your student is studying in. I'd be engaging with them tomorrow morning, making contact with the, uh, whoever it is in the school and you'd be guided as to whether it's the additional education needs department or with the guidance counseling department. Uh, but there's a sense of race, which is the application for supports for the leave insert. Unfortunately, it is too late for the DARE application because that would have had to have been applied for before the 1st of February. And then the online piece in the CEO applied for before the 1st of May, 1st of March. So unfortunately, while the DARE piece is gone, definitely engage with, because there may be an opportunity, but definitely engage with the the a additional education needs learning support person in the school first thing in the morning because they'll be able to advise in relation to the leave and search supports. Thanks for all of these questions. Um, how should a student calm themselves down in the middle of an exam if they're panicking? So that's a really good question. I, I think it is so important for students if they're really panicking to, and it's easy to say because often when we say don't panic, that's the that's what one does. But do you know that piece earlier on we were saying around the, the three minute, just the pause whereby a student will just stop, just sense again a calmness, a bit more of a breathing and a sense. It's actually a really good idea in the exam to take a moment to, often we'd say to students, start answering the question that they feel they're going to work best at just to calm them down. So what the advice would be giving there to that student would say, but there's a panicking, the sense of start with a question that you feel comfortable with, because what can often happen is you just get into the pattern, you get into the zone, and then suddenly you're saying, okay, here's the set of questions that I, this is the question that I find easiest, start with that because that will really help the student. Uh, but then that that breathing exercise that we talked about in the sense of grounding is, is so important there as well. Um, there's a sense about any particular tips for the neurodiverse student? I think there's going to be the part there whereby the department, the additional educational needs department in the school and the supports that are there uh, would be very important to engage with that. And, and often what we would have is a sense of the capacity to meet with the student, the additional education needs department and, and, and you as a parent to work through the particular tips that are there and, and basically be able to build on the knowledge from the learning that's there and the, and, the, and the resources that are coming from the school to help those those particular tips. I, I hope that's helpful. Um, there's a question about the advice for your Leaving Cert child is very unsure what course to do even after work placement and TY. Um, OK, so there is the aspect of what's called an interest inventory. There is an actual free resource on the careers portal website and a student will be able to and it, it doesn't cost anything. So the advice we'd give is that sense of uncertainty. So, so often a student might feel I'm uncertain as to what I want to do. And while that can be helpful because it leaves an open mind, in some way it, things move on. So the advice I'd be giving there is that there's a free website called the Careers Portal. And in it, there is a careers, what's called interest inventory. And a student will be guided as to the kind of areas that would suit them most. What you're trying to do here is what we find in the research is that a person who's working in an area that suits their personality type, what actually happens is that they are, there's what's called congruence. So what you're trying to do is find a course and then a career area that would be sort of congruent with a person's personality type and attributes. So some of us are more practical oriented, more engineering, others are more social and so on. So there's a, there's a piece there. So, so thank you for those for those questions. Um, with the orals coming up during Easter, my son is now considering his orals only and not studying anything else. Is this normal, or should they also be studying 
there are other subjects. Thanks for your advice. No, no listen, thanks a million. And, and one of the things that I find here in the school, but I also found as a parent, is that the orals become almost all consuming. And and yes, they are a moment in time. And yes, they'll be over maybe for most subjects, to, for most students, there'll be two. I, I think in fairness, it is natural that it almost is so important and that they are spending so much time. I, I think it's inevitably that it's weighted at this stage because they'll be doing practice orals as well. Um, yes, I think there's possibly a case of just trying to keep up with classwork but the sense of hoping that they're going to be studying and doing big quantums of study. I think it's only natural uh, from what I was saying earlier on. It's that certainly there's a piece whereby the orals does do seem to be all consuming. So it, it, it's quite understandable that there is a sense at the moment where that's taking a, a huge priority. Please understand it will pass because once they get through the two orals, I, I think there's a sense of the sense of suddenly there is the performance piece as well. So. Um, that that's very understandable. I hope that's helpful. Um, bear with me a second, and I'm just checking that I'm getting the questions here. Uh, thank you very much for staying on and sending through those questions. Um, so I think I've captured most of them, but there's some new posts here. Uh, yeah, so I think there's a lovely question here about being studying hard, but not cleverly. Yeah, so so. I think I was given once in my life an analogy, which is that we have to be a racehorse, not a workhorse. And absolutely the sense of clever. I think the practice on the exam papers will create that cleverness more so than the hard and the capacity to be able to do the questions without an aid. So there's certain things there around the clever so I fully, fully appreciate that that sentiment. So it's about being strategic. And understanding what are the core areas that come up relatively often. And. The, what I'm hearing as well is hard as in a long time. So, so the capacity to actually study maybe for now students are different, but but on average, that sort of 50 minute and then 10 minute break really works well for most. But but it. There is no general rule for all students, so some students will be individualistic as in it will work best for themselves. So there's a sort of understanding that. But but I take the sentiment exactly the clever and, and the past papers is probably the element in, in that. Um, let me see now, is there any other questions that have kind of come through here? Uh, Just want to make sure I've got all the questions. Thank you very much for sending these through. I think I've captured a fair few of them. If I may come back to the neurodiverse student, that that sense of it's the supports so so important that the school will provide, and to be engaging with that 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 the the, the support of um, department in the school to assist the, the student um, be the best that they can be. And, and obviously there's an element around the application for uh, the race accommodation within the school through the, to the exams and having that in place as well. So, so I think the, the state, the race program as well would be very, very important to, to engage with, with that. And then in terms of college, can I say that colleges are more and more aware for that neurodiverse student and have put in place, I, I know my own experience from being visiting a number of colleges that the supports that are in place are become more and more prevalent. Uh, and I know um, I was at a presentation recently with the minister uh, who has created significant funding for, for supports for neurodiverse students in various campuses as well. So um, I know that doesn't answer everything, but but I hope it's 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 of help. You see now. I think we're coming to the end of our questions, but can I just reassure you that I'm not in a rush away, so it's just coming up to seven o'clock and um, we had penciled in up till half seven, so I, I'm genuinely not in a rush away and um, I will wait a few moments and um, maybe another five minutes or so take any questions that have come true. Um, 
and maybe we'll we'll wrap up about five past seven if that's okay. Um, so, um, I, but I but as you sense from me, I'm I'm keen to to stay and answer any questions that come through. If you've joined us late, one of the things I was saying earlier on was that the slides will be kind of coming through. Um, and um, they'll be going out to everybody uh, in the morning from my colleague, Charlotte Campbell. Um, I'll just go back for a second, if I may, to that PLC courses and just to reassure the question there, which was that colleges for their education have been really helpful. And there's a new um, application system that you as parents may not be aware of. It's called the National Tertiary Office. So there's about 25 new degree programs that come along, a combination of colleges of further education, whereby students spend two years in a college of further education with a guaranteed progression to uh, two years, typically two years in a higher education college in one of the universities or te technological universities. And it's across a whole range of areas like multimedia, nursing in some of the colleges in the west of Ireland. And so, um, if if you wanted more more information, at the National Treasurer Office is really helpful in, in that regard. There's a new question here. Th thank you very much for that that um, comments of appreciation. I really really appreciate that. Um, there's a question here. Is it too late to move to ordinary level maths? Well, it may be a lot easier. I think it also contains some. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I think that's a fair comment. Um, so, so what can happen is a student has done the mocks for the higher paper. And in fairness, the class test during the year may not have been going well, but there was always a sense of let's stay with this. And there sometimes is a crystallization when the actual higher level mocks come true where students realize that almost there's a slight risk because not only might I I might get less than 30 which is like 29.99 and at 29.99% I get a H8 and for a significant number of colleges a fail a H8 in maths would stop you getting into a significant number of courses so if we take, say, Dublin City University, uh, University of Limerick, uh, Trinity College, uh, there are three of the universities that require maths. If we take the NUI universities like UCD and um, Minute University, UCC, um, a lot of their courses require maths, not all of them. So for instance, arts and law and other courses don't need maths at all, but a lot of the courses. So that aspect whereby I don't think it's too late to switch to the ordinary level, but it's so important to connect in with the maths teacher in that school because I am conscious different structures are in place in different schools. So I just can't say it in every case. I know in the school here in the Institute of Education, people would be able to change at this stage, but I'm just not conscious it's available for every single school. So I'd definitely be encouraging that student and you as a parent to be engaging with the maths teacher in the school tomorrow morning to put in place piece there and which then after the orals there's the second week in easter they may have a chance to to look again at the ordinary level paper uh, but th thank you for that question um so thank you very much um yeah <laughs> there's a lot <laughs> one of the parents is talking about keeping ourselves grounded i i think so because in some way my first slide talked about um, a holistic, a whole house. I think the leave insert inevitably impacts the entire house. So it's not only the student who's immersed in it, but, but you as parents, there's a sense of walking on eggshells. There's older siblings that have to turn down the, you know, turn down the music. And there's a whole piece there, but it's actually understanding that it is, as I said, time limited, that it will pass. And so there's a sense, I think, for there's a, how shall I put it? The household becomes a community, so we're all just helping each other as we as we get through that. So, so that sense of grounded is is lovely. I think so, and it will be just the slides on tomorrow recording as the Q and A is very helpful. Uh, Hilary, I 
um, very conscious that I could say the wrong answer here. I think it's the recording. You'd be pleased to, to know it's the recording. Um, I'd be sort of 19 out of 20 saying that because um, I sense from my colleague Charlotte was saying that that there was certainly uh, the recording. So apologies, apologies, folks. I think it's the recording. So I suspect and, and, and I know what you're saying about the Q&A. I think the full recording will, will be going out to, tomorrow. Um, thank you for, for all of that. Um, there's a question about different levels of there. Is it just accepted, not accepted? I wonder, as my daughter's neurodivergent and has general anxiety disorder and missed a huge amount of school. So that's really tough. Uh, and I can appreciate how difficult that has been. Um, fair play, she, she did very well in the mocks. Um, so your question specifically is, are there different levels of there? So just to answer that specifically, you either are eligible for there or not. So it is like, as a computer scientist would say, binary. So it's a yes or no switch. And at the last week in June, your daughter will be advised by the DARE assessment unit in the CEO that she is eligible for DARE or not. Um, so just to say that, and um, can you tell me what specific sports for insert might be available for her? So there definitely is scope within the race, within the department concessions, but that would be managed through the additional uh, educational needs department in the school. So I think, again, I'd be saying connect in first thing in the morning just to check in that. Um, so those supports would be through the what's called a race accommodation. Uh, but to go back to your first question, which is, is there different shades of there or not? There isn't. It's either eligible and therefore points, concessions and supports. But can I reassure you as a parent and as a student that irrespective of whether a student has their eligibility or got a place on the base of their points and so on, the supports in a university or in a college of higher education would be in place regardless of whether a person came through the DARE scheme or not. So those DARE disability supports would uh, be an under a funded piece by the state in, in terms of colleges. And I've worked in a number of colleges myself, so I can reassure you of that. Um, so I think we are, I think we're okay. Uh, so I hope I that that was okay. Um, so I'm, I'm conscious it's it's just after five past seven. Uh, there's a new post has come in here. And thank you very much for that. Thank you for those comments of, of, uh, of thanks. Uh, so my, my name is John McGinnity. Um, I work here as a guidance counselor here in the school. Uh, I'm delighted to help you in any way. Um, there's a couple of people have just put up their hands. So if you wouldn't mind, if you put your question into the Q&A, uh, I'll definitely uh, stay. Uh, but I am conscious if people are feeling that they wish to to um, switch off or whatever, I'll definitely stay. Uh, but but I am conscious that people need to kind of a sense as to when we're we're finishing. So by all means, just. Uh, pop a question in and uh, we, we'll finish up shortly. Thank you very much for all these questions. So I think we'll wrap up now that uh, there's no more questions coming in. Can I just say uh, it's been a pleasure to have been with you tonight. Um, it's one of these things that we've all learned from, unfortunately, COVID, unfortunately, but but it's amazing how we all just connected in a different way. And uh, I'm conscious we're probably connecting in this evening to people all over the country. I know it's extremely wet in Dublin. So uh, thank you for taking the time to join us this evening on behalf of myself and all our colleagues here in the Institute of Education and David Ball, who introduced the session. Thank you very much. And uh, it's been a real pleasure to have been with you this evening. And uh, you take care. And I'm just going to leave the session now and, and wish you well. All the best. Bye bye.